thanking you and praising you for your spirit. We thank you for your, just your presence here this morning, Father. I pray that you would use me in the next few minutes, Father, that I would be able to deliver your word. And, Father, that you would gain all the honor and the glory for everything that's said. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. I told someone last week, I preached on casting it out, and I must have run some people off. But that's okay. Because it's true. So today we're going to continue in that theme. We're going to talk about casting it out, but we're going to talk about who you are. And we're going to talk about why you can and how real the demonic spirit that we battle every day is. We may understand that it's real. And we may understand that it's real in the born-again believer and in the world also. And all these problems that we see from the demonic. And you know, I don't have to use demonic. I can just use world. But all these things that we see that are going on around about us, we see the sickness, we see all the depression, we see all the different things that go on around us. And I wonder sometimes why do we see all this and we don't do anything about it. It's our job. It's what we're supposed to be. So why don't we? It's because we don't have any confidence in who we are. Do you have confidence in being the Christian that God set you to be? Do you have confidence in being that born-again believer, that one that carries the name of Jesus Christ? Do you have confidence in Jesus? Because that's the authority that we operate in. That's the authority that we work in. So we have to ask, why is this lack of confidence so prevalent in the Christian church today? What's missing? And what do we need to be reminded and on a regular basis reminded to overcome this lack of confidence. I want you to look at what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Chapter 3 in the book of Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to them, and starting in verse 13. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So what is this one thing that Paul refers to in this verse? What is this one thing that Paul is doing? Look at verse 14. He says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So that's the one thing. What does that mean? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's the kingdom. Now, we are a kingdom-focused church. That's our motto, if you will, but that is our, who we are. We are a kingdom-focused church. What does that mean? What does it mean to be focused on the kingdom? That's what we're supposed to be here on this earth. God has given the kingdom to each one of us. It's on the inside of us, and we're supposed to reveal the kingdom of God to the entire earth. We can't do that if we're not confident in who we are and what we are. We're going to be hiding instead of standing out in confidence. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul tells us to be perfect-minded. How are we to be perfect-minded? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I always go to the scripture to find the answer to the question. Starting in verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned 
spiritually discerned. Earlier this morning in Bible study, we talked about spiritually discerning. If you can't spiritually discern, you're never going to be able to recognize those demonic spirits that we're battling. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to battle them in your own life, and you're going to battle them in the lives of those around you. And if you don't think that a Christian can have those demonic spirits trying to control him, you're sadly mistaken, because they do. I've seen it way, way too many times, and I've experienced it myself. We talked this morning about how every once in a while we just have to do some housekeeping. And we have to clean our house out. Thomas was talking about walking around our home and cleaning our home out. Well, you have to walk around this one too and clean it out every once in a while. Because you'll be amazed at what will attach itself to you. And we open doors and we allow things to come in and we think, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Halloween's coming up. One of the worst times of the year. People will open their doors and they will allow all these demonic spirits to enter in, to walk in, and they'll never show them the way back out. And they think, oh, well, it's all just done in fun. And Satan's laughing all the way. And he's enjoying it. So be careful with what you allow in. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 tells us, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. If we spiritually judge everything that's about us through spiritual discernment, no man can judge us spiritually because we are the Spirit of God. Hope you understand that. Verse 16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Who are you? You are that person who has the mind of Christ. You are perfect. You can spiritually discern. Those are the things we've learned already. So operate that way. Don't be timid. Don't think that Satan is more powerful than you are. Had a preacher tell me one time, oh, you shouldn't preach that. Satan's going to come against you. He doesn't dare. He's been defeated. And he's still defeated. He is a liar. And his position is under my feet, under your feet. He knows. But now if I don't know, he's welcome to come right in. We have got to know. Back in Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same things. He's saying, if you have attained the mind of Christ, and if you're born again, you have, all that are like-minded should walk in that mind of Christ. There should be no difference between one born-again believer and another born-again believer. We all have the same mind. We all have the mind of Christ. We operate in the same spirit. We can discern the spirits. We see what's around us. We see what Satan is doing. In verse 17 of Philippians chapter 3, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Paul is saying, pay attention. Pay attention to those people around you. Make sure that you're walking with those who have the like mind that you have. Because if you don't pay attention and you entertain those people around you as friends who don't have the mind of Christ, you will adopt their mind. And that is the mind of the world. Verse 18 says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. 
One of the hardest things I ever done in my life was sit down and make a list of friends and say, this friend has the mind of Christ, this friend doesn't. What does that tell me? That tells me that I have friends that I need to witness to. That tells me that I have friends who are lost without Christ. And if I witness to that friend and that friend rejects what I'm offering them through Jesus Christ, then I need to recalculate my friendship list. I need to make sure of who I'm actually pulling into my inner circle. Is that easy? No, it's not. It's hard. But it's what we need to do. Once you've come to the mind of Christ, your heart is broken for those who are not. Notice he refers to the people as enemies. Enemies. You can't entertain the enemy. Spiritual things, if spiritual things can't be seen, the Spirit of God is not present. So in a relationship with another person, the things of God must be present. You've got to be able to spiritually discern the things of God in that relationship. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this is the way Satan brings those demonic spirits in and they attach themselves to us not to possess us as born-again believers, but to control us as born-again believers. And I tell you, it can happen so, so quickly and so unnoticeable, you'll be amazed. If the Spirit of God is not present, all of this is nonsense. And I think Halloween is one of those times when you hear that most of all, I've told people that, you know, Halloween as a born-again believer is something you shouldn't be celebrating. And that person would say, well, it's innocent. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong there. There's a problem. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. Now, Paul continues to talk about these people. He says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. If the things of God aren't important, and only the th earthly things are important, these are the things that we're to judge. These are the things that we're to pay attention to. These people are the flesh, as Paul would put it. And their flesh and their desires don't line up with God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation, our testimony... Our everything is in heaven. If we have friends in our lives who are all about everything but heaven, we need to make some decisions. And when Paul says our conversation is in heaven, that's what he means. He means our conversation, our thoughts, our thinking should always be of heaven, of the things of God. We should be looking at everything through that lens, through the lens of the things of heaven, through the lens of the things of God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the workings whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Did you get all that? Did you hear what he said? He said, change our vile bodies. He's talking about the glorified body. He's referring to the rapture. He's talking about when we, the church is actually taken out of the earth. 
And then he is describing the only way that that can happen is through the mind of Christ. And he's talking about he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Subdue all things means the things of the flesh, the things of this world. He's already defeated. We just have to step into his victory and enjoy it. Okay, we know that Paul is talking about here. We, we, we understand what he's saying. But is all of this for the future someday or is when we get to heaven? And what is it that Paul is actually trying to tell us here? In verse 20, he's talking about heaven where God abides. We all have heard about how Christ brought all of the captivity out of paradise and now, after the resurrection, all that are in Christ sit with him at the right hand of the Father. And a lot of people would look at this and say, well, that's, that's what all of this is talking about. It's talking about that time. No. God didn't just turn, us, turn his back on us while we're on the earth and say, do the best you can do. Just carry on. And Satan's going to whip you every day, and you just have to take it. But one day you're going to die, and I'm going to take you to heaven, and everything will be fine then. That's not the God I serve. The God I serve says, I give you power. And a power and authority that I give you is in the name of Jesus Christ. I am in Jesus Christ. I am in that power. I am in that authority. And if I don't operate in that authority and power, it is my fault because God has given it to me. I'm not waiting to be in heaven to operate in the authority and power of Jesus Christ. I won't need to when I'm in heaven. But I need to today. I need to right now. Because this world doesn't like me. This world wants to kill me. This world hates me. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. They hated him so much they nailed him to a cross. What Paul is talking about is not for the future, it's for right now. And that's the way that we need to operate. We need to operate here and now in the power that God has given us in the authority of Jesus' name. You should be speaking blessings, not curses. And you should be speaking blessings over every life, every part, Every thought, every activity, every problem, every decision, speak the blessing of God. Don't do anything in your life that you haven't spoken the blessing, the authority of Jesus Christ over. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's how you are successful operating in the blessing of God. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. These are some verses that a lot of people kind of get sideways with, but I want you to listen to what it says. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus said that what he intends for us and what he intends for us to do is to store those things in heaven that mean something. All the things, the natural, the physical things we can store on this earth, most of the time, by the time a couple of years pass by, you don't even remember them. Amen. They're gone. You've either spent it, used it, lost it, somebody stole it, or you gave it to somebody. But the things that are stored in heaven are there forever. And God keeps account of that. 
Nobody's going to take it. You're not going to lose it. He's going to keep record of it. So when he says that where your treasure is is where your heart is, your treasure should be in heaven because that's where your heart should be. And your heart should be that part of you that desires the best possible situation for yourself and for those loved ones around you. So when we store those things in heaven and Satan comes along and he tries to trick us and steal from us and destroy us, just remember those treasures he can't touch. Never be afraid to take Satan on because he is lost from the beginning. Never be afraid in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ to speak against him, to call him out, to address him as what he is, a liar, a deceiver, defeated foe. And the only time he becomes your enemy is when you listen to him. And unfortunately, too many Christians listen to the enemy. Don't listen to him. Don't entertain him. Speak to him in the name of Jesus Christ, and he has to flee. The scripture says to resist the, uh, the devil, and he has to flee. The way you resist the devil is in the name of the Jesus Christ. He can't handle it. He's gone. When we realize that this life that we've been given to live on this earth has a purpose. And God gives each one of us a purpose in this life. And that purpose is to store up those treasures in heaven. I heard a story one time. I've told some of you this. A person went to heaven and they were being shown around and they walked by this huge room and the door was open and there were just shelves and shelves and shelves of all these boxes in this room. And the person said, I, I want to go in here. I want to see this. They said, no, you don't need to go in there. And the person said, but I want to go in there. I want to see. But you don't need to go in there. Why can't I go in there? He said, that, that's all the treasure that you missed while you were on earth. But it's stored here. But you missed all of that while you were on earth. Still stored in heaven, but you missed it while you were on earth. Don't miss anything God has for you on this earth. God didn't put us here to be broke, sick, and depressed. God put us here to be a shining light for the entire world. You can't do that unless you're prosperous in health, in wealth, in well-being. Understand who you are. So when you go to cast out some evil spirit somewhere, whether it's in your, your life or it's in the life of your children or in the life of someone around you, your neighbor or whoever it happens to be, that you stand knowing who you are. And Satan doesn't have a chance. If you don't know who you are, he will take control of you. And he will push you wherever he wants to push you. That's why we teach, cast it out. If we allow the demonic into our lives, that's what we'll have. Don't allow it. Take an inventory. Sit down every once in a while and just ask the Holy Spirit, show me things in my life that don't need to be there. Because those are things that Satan has seen an open door and he stepped in. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to uh, cure diseases. Now the reason I put that verse there, I wanted you to understand something. These twelve, these are the apostles, they're not saved because Jesus is talking to them. Think about it. He gives them authority. He gives them power. And he sends them out. 
And we know that from reading this that Jesus wielded this authority because we see, we've seen verses, scriptures, where Jesus was casting out demons. He was healing the sick. If, actually, if you look at his ministry, that was the bulk of his ministry. Healing the sick and casting out demons. So now he gives us power to these 12 who he has called, who didn't volunteer, he has called them. And they're all, these 12 are, are, are a myriad of different personalities. They're all together different people. And he sends them out. And he sends them out with the authority and the power to cast out demons and heal the sick in his name. Now, I want you to think about the scenario here for a minute. Jesus has just sent out 12 lost people in his authority, in his power, to, to heal the sick and to cast out demons. They don't have the Spirit of God on the inside of them. They're simply operating in his authority and his power. Think about who you are as a born-again believer. You have the Spirit of God on the inside of you that's guiding and leading and directing you in everything, every word you speak, everything that you do, and you have the authority of the power of Jesus Christ to cast out demons and heal the sick and to preach the gospel. Think about it. Think about who you are. The biggest Victory that Satan has today is Christians who sit around and with no idea of who they are in Jesus Christ. They're just waiting. They're waiting to go to heaven. And they're going to walk by that room with all those boxes on the shelves and they're going to say, you don't need to look in there. Those are all the blessings that you missed when you were on earth. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. What is Peter telling us? He's saying Satan, making a lot of noise, he's going around to see who will listen to him. He says, and some people will. They'll listen to him. But there's a lot of people who are lifting you up every day, who are praying for you and don't even know your name. who are asking God through the Holy Spirit and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ to anoint you to not listen to the roaring lion. It's a lie. Peter understood what we're talking about today. He understood. He said, resist him, cast him out. Throw him out. Don't give him a place. But here's the thing. If you cast him out, if you throw him out, You've got to fill that space because if you don't, he's going to come back. When you throw him out, you fill that space with what? Things of God. Well, I don't know what to fill it with. Open your Bible. Start to read. Fill that space. Don't allow Satan any space whatsoever to come back in. Resist him. Cast him out. Remember that there's many Christians that form this brotherhood, if you will, that covers the earth. And if you're a true Christian, you're praying for all Christians all over the world. You're lifting them up. 1 John chapter 4, 5 and 6. They are from the world and therefore speak from the the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not 
from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Remember I told you earlier, the spiritual things are nonsense to the world. But the spiritual things to the true church are spiritual things. They're true. They're truth. They're things of God. When we understand who we are, we come away from that understanding with a strong assurance. And we know that in Jesus Christ, we have power and we have authority. Not in me, not in you. In Jesus Christ, we have authority. And when we start to operate in that authority that has been given to us freely, Satan can't touch you. Never be afraid of him. He says, Jesus shows us two ways he confronted Satan or the demonic. If you study how Jesus dealt with Satan. In Matthew chapter 4, sometimes when you've got some time and you, you're actually searching for scripture to read, just read Matthew chapter 4. It is the chapter in, in the scripture where the temptation of Jesus is recorded. And if you remember that, every temptation that Satan offers Jesus, what does Jesus respond with? He responds with a scripture. He didn't respond with an argument to Satan. He says, the word says. And he responded to every temptation that come from Satan. I'm telling you, when temptation comes, respond to it by scripture. The name of Jesus, the demonic have to flee. This is how we must do it today. This is how we do it in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, the name of the the demon, is the other way that Jesus addressed these things. If you remember, there's a couple of stories, different stories in the Bible. The first thing Jesus would do, he would have a demonic, oppressed person. He would go up to that person and he would speak directly to the demon, to the demonic And the thing he wanted to know is, who are you? What's your name? And once the demon would tell him their name, because they had to, because in his authority and in his power, the demon had to respond. Then Jesus would say, in his power, in his authority, you have to leave now, go on. And they would have to flee. So those are the two ways that Jesus addressed the demonic. Those are the two ways you address the demonic. The same way. Same thing. He was our example. He was what we were given to follow. So don't let dealing, and I hate almost to use the word demonic because everybody goes, oh, you know, that's that spooky stuff and all this kind of stuff. If it's not of God, it's an evil spirit. It's of Satan. It's demonic. So if it's not of God, cast it out. Get rid of it. You don't need it. You can't have it because it will build up and build up and build up in your life to the point to where you can't operate. I've seen it. I've seen it build up in people's lives to the point to where they become numb, totally inoperable as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. And Satan's goal is to take a born-again believer, and set him down so that he can't do anything for the kingdom. It would please him to no end to have every pew in this building with someone sitting on it that's just sitting there. They've got their ticket to heaven, but they're totally useless as far as the kingdom of heaven is concerned in this earth. So understand what your role is in this earth today You have a purpose. You've been called. You weren't just saved just for the sake of being saved. You have a purpose. You were called. 
And you're called in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, and you operate in that authority and that power. And that's who we are, that's what we are, and don't let Satan get in your way because that's what he tries to do, to block you, to stop you, to fill you full of his hatred, his evil, and most Christians don't even know they carry it. Get rid of it. Can we all stand, please? We're not finished with this yet. We're going to go a little bit further with it. So next week we're going to be looking at a few other things. But just be aware of how Satan is, how Satan plays the game. And it is a game to him. He's trying to take from God those things that God owns. It's what he's always done. He tries to counterfeit everything that belongs to God. And he tries to pull those things out of the kingdom and put them, take them from one kingdom and put them in another. His kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom we're part of is the kingdom of light. And we are put on this earth and we are born again to take our place in that kingdom. That's what we're supposed to be. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. We're to be the light in the dark place. And this world is a dark place. So if you're here this morning and you're without Jesus Christ and you don't know the Lord and Savior and you don't know the power and the authority that I'm talking about to operate in, then this is the time that God has given. If you feel the draw of the Holy Spirit and you know that God is speaking to you this morning, then you can change that part of your life today. You can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you do, your life will never be the same. I guarantee you. If you're here this morning and you just feel like you need to renew your commitment to God, you need to just start new with God. God says, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank y'all. Y'all come back and be with us on Wednesday night as we continue to study Genesis. We're almost to the end of Genesis. I think we're going to go straight in to the Exodus after we do Genesis. We've got had a lot of questions about what happens after this. So I think we're going to go into the Exodus. So come and be a part of that. Be in prayer about the Sunday night movie uh, uh, program that we're going to start uh, and pray about your involvement in that. Have a wonderful week. Uh, uh, take care and be in prayer. Be observant. Watch the things that are going on around you. Pay attention to what's going on around you. This coming week is the week of Halloween, so Satan is going to be at his best. So just pay attention to what's going on. I'm going to ask Brother Steve to close us in prayer this morning.